Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another sermon here at Fresh Vision Church in El Paso, Texas. Thank you for taking time out of your day to watch or hear this message. I hope that by the time you're done listening to it or watching it, that you will have been blessed, you will have been encouraged, and you will have been strengthened. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them at the bottom of this YouTube video, or you can also send us a message on Facebook. I'd like to also invite you to visit our website at fvcelp.org. There you will find our vision and mission statement. You will find our statement of faith. You will find a short bio about myself. And you can also leave us a comment or question at the bottom of the homepage there. If there's anything I can do to minister to you, please feel free to contact me. Again, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to check us out. And now that I've mentioned that, I'd like to move on with today's message. I've titled our message today, Dare to Believe. So today we're going to be covering the last three sections of Luke chapter 18. Here we're going to see two more interactions people had with Jesus and a prediction from our Lord and Savior. So as we finish off this chapter, Jesus again will focus on faith. I hope that after today's message you will have discovered that faith knows it can ask for God's mercy and receive God's reward for a persistently faithful life. So before I get into God's word, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray that those watching or listening to this message will be blessed. And I pray that you will remove any kind of distraction at the moment, Lord, so that their attentions will be completely focused on you. May your word go out powerfully, and may it be received with an open heart. We want to hear you now, Lord. We praise you, and we glorify you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so last week we left off on verse 17, and we'll be picking up in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and read along. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. A ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. I have kept all these for my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told them, you still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. After he heard this, he became, very, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Seeing that he became sad, Jesus said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Then Peter said, Look, we have left what we had and followed you. So he said to them, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left a house, wife, or brothers, or sisters, parents, or children because of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more at this time and eternal life in the age to come. This section that we just read illustrates the case of a man who would not receive the kingdom of God like a little child. One day a certain Jew came to Jesus with a question centered around a point of contention between, between two leading groups of Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sad, the Sadducees, using only the first five books of the Old Testament, found in these books no reference to resurrection. So they denied that the resurrection of the dead was possible. Pharisees, on the other hand, 
followed all three parts of the Jewish canon, the law, the prophets, and the writings. They saw definite proof of the resurrection in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and many other references, particularly in the Psalms and Isaiah. Now it's uncertain if this ruler was trying to get Jesus to take sides or if he was searching for a certain hope in his own life. Luke doesn't give us his motivation, just the question. So addressing him as good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Savior, first of all, caught the man's attention by challenging his description of him. Why do you call me good? He reminded him that in traditional Jewish theology, no one is good except God alone. Spurgeon wrote, it was as if Jesus said, you come to me asking about what good thing you can do to inherit eternal life, but what do you really know about goodness? The argument is clear. Either Jesus was good, or he ought not to have been called good. But as there is none good but God, Jesus, who is good, must be God. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, without knowing it, the ruler had linked Jesus to God. Now, we must admit that Jesus here wasn't affirming or denying that he was God here. But Luke was expecting his readers to see the link that Jesus made and to affirm the obvious that Jesus being good was also God. Jesus then dealt with the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think most of us know that eternal life isn't inherited and it isn't gained by doing good works. Eternal life is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. So in taking the ruler back to the Ten Commandments, the Lord Jesus wasn't implying that he could ever be saved by keeping the law. Rather, he was using the law in an effort to convict the man of sin. The Lord Jesus then recited to him five of the commandments that had to do with our duty with our fellow man. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your mother, your father and your mother. Well, apparently, when you heard this, he didn't even have, it didn't have the convicting effect in the life of that man because he arrogantly claimed to have kept them all from his youth. Now, I won't get into a long, drawn-out discussion about his answer by trying to point out that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not really the point here. The issue here is obedience and eternal life. This Jew was under the impression that by keeping the moral law of his religion, that he deserved eternal life. But deep inside, he felt that something was missing. What he may have really wanted to know was if there was more beyond being religious and trying to have a good moral life. Jesus answered him by returning to the theme that he had addressed so often, wealth and dedication. By saying what he did in verse 22, the Lord was basically asking the rich ruler, do you trust in possessions more than you trust God? Are you trying to put your trust in both possessions and God at the same time? Can you live without your possessions but cannot live without your God? Well, sell all you, ha all you have and find out. Although these weren't his exact words, Jesus essentially told him, take the money you get from your cell and distribute it to the poor. Do that and come and follow me. 
with the rest of my penniless disciples and see what obedience to God's word is really all about. Now, we have to be careful because we may make two mistakes here. The first mistake we need to be careful about is believing this applies to everyone. When Jesus never made this general command to all who would follow him, but especially to this one rich man whose riches were clearly an obstacle to his discipleship. Instead, many rich, rich people can do more good in the world by continuing to make money and using those resources for the glory of God and for the good of others. Second mistake is to believe this applies to no one. When there are clearly those today for whom the best thing they could do for themselves spiritually is to radically forsake the materialism that is ruining them. Francis of Assisi was a notable one who heard Jesus speak these words to him and gave away all that he had to follow Jesus. Well, Jesus' words seemed to have hit that rich young ruler in his weakest spot, his bank account. Evidently, he was very rich. Even though he considered himself a good person, he trusted in his wealth to make life meaningful and hopeful. So he became extremely sad because he realized there was no way he can get, uh, give up his money even for God's kingdom. It's important to understand that the problem here wasn't that this man possessed riches, but that riches possessed him. Thus, Jesus wasn't trying to make him miserable. He was trying to set him free. The principle of what the Lord was asking that rich young ruler still applies to us Christians today. God may challenge and require an individual to give up something for the sake of his kingdom that he still allows someone else. Sadly though, there are many who perish because they will not forsake what God tells them to do. Well, upon seeing the ruler reject the invitation to be saved, Luke tells us in verse 24, that just as one would sigh deeply at a funeral to express grief at losing someone special, a heartbroken Jesus said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Our Lord understood the sad truth that those who are abundantly health healthy will have a hard time giving up their trust in their possessions. Why? because many of them are so focused on keeping it or acquiring more of it that they can't see the inevitable. That one day, they're not only gonna lose it all, but they'll also be robbed of eternal treasure because they never invested in it. Even today, the majority of the richest people have never really experienced the need to trust someone or something outside their own intelligence and wealth. But this whole section also raises disturbing questions for those who consider themselves believers. How can we say that we truly love our neighbors when we live in wealth and comfort, when others are perishing for want of the gospel of Christ? To make the point of how hard it is for a wealthy person to enter into God's kingdom, Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. In this hyperbolic statement, he described the utterly impossible. He was implying that the lure of wealth overpowers the lure of the kingdom, not just in this rich Jewish administrator's life, but virtually in the lives of all rich people and many who are not quite so rich. Thus, the first step of the kingdom is not to solve the problem by putting a camel through a needle's eye. 
The first step is to get rid of the burden of riches so a person has nothing to trust but Jesus. You see, as long as a rich person makes a God of, out of his wealth, it's going to stand between himself and his soul's salvation, and he cannot be converted. And this isn't just the case with wealth, but it also applies to other gods people have made for themselves. This is the reason there aren't a lot of rich people who are saved. And those who are will be known for their brokenness before God. So upon hearing what the Lord had said, an amazed audience wanted to know if those who've been blessed with wealth can't be saved, then who can be saved? They clearly saw that Jesus had described an impossible. However, Jesus' quick answer is one that we should all reference when it seems that a loved one's salvation is impossible. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, if you really believe this, then let me give you some advice or some suggestion. Stop trying to figure out the hows and the whys. Just let God do it. Continue to love the person, but leave them in the hands of God. Now, if you're among the wealthy and are struggling with this is issue, trust Him with your life more than you trust your riches. Place your faith in Jesus and your riches in God's control. Then watch Him work the impossible. Well, blunt and to the point, Peter reminded the Lord in verse 28, Look, we have left what we had and followed you. And the Lord replied back by reminding him of something important, not just to them, but to everyone who has decided to surrender their lives to him. Those who have given up life's closest relationships, greatest responsibilities, and strongest commitments to follow Christ had a greater reward coming. Now, precise details about what that reward is, it isn't really given, but it's put into two stages. In this age, the committed, self-denying follower will receive many times more than what they've already given up. Now, it's possible that what he's speaking of here is a greater spiritual family, that the family of believers will be more important, more numerous, and more meaningful than a family, than a believer's family of origin. But he could also be speaking of something much more indefinite. He may have just been generally saying that our faith will lead to the rewards. In other words, God has a reward for you, but you don't need to know exactly what that reward is. You just need to trust God. The second part of the disciples' return is eternal life in the age to come. This doesn't mean that eternal life is gained by forsaking a house, a wife, or brothers or sisters or parents and children. Rather, it refers to a quality of life that begins here on earth with Jesus as Lord and extends all the way through the resurrection into the eternal kingdom. It's thus the full realization of the life that had been received after a person has been born again. It's that moment you absolutely know as a child of God, you're now living life in its fullness. Now, in between this encounter and our next encounter, our Lord Jesus had to have an important conversation with his disciples. So let's check that out now by going to verse 31. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took the twelve aside and told them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that is written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked, insulted, spit on. And after, three, after they flog him, they will kill him, and he will rise on the third day. They understood none of these things. The meaning of the saying 
was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. For the third time, the Lord took his 12 disciples aside and explained to them in detail what awaited him in Jerusalem. Now, in case you're taking notes, the other two times were in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, and back again in Luke chapter 9, verse 44. He began with an affirmation. Everything that is written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. Although this appears to be a reassuring statement, it actually turned out to be anything but that. So what did the prophet say in the Old Testament about Jesus, the Son of Man? He will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked, insulted, spit on, and after they flog him, they will kill him. Now, if you just put these things together, the Lord is describing a pretty intense suffering. For example, suffering from the disloyalty of friends, suffering from injustice, suffering from a deliberate insult and humiliation, suffering from physical pain, suffering from great humiliation and degradation. So as we go through the next few chapters in Luke's Gospel, we'll get more into detail about these sufferings. But then he adds this at the end of verse 33, and he will rise on the third day. Here Jesus was informing his disciples that the story wouldn't end with his suffering, humiliation, and death. It will resume in victory when he would rise again in resurrection glory. I keep in mind that everything he predicted were actions that Jesus would apparently have no control over. Yet he confidently announced to his disciples that all of it would happen. Amazingly enough, the disciples understood none of these things. The meaning of his words was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. It seems hard for us to understand why they would be so dull in this matter. But the reason is probably this. Their minds were so filled with thoughts of a temporal deliverer who would rescue them from the yoke of Rome and set up a kingdom immediately that they refused to entertain any other program. This shows us that we often believe what we want to believe and resist the truth it, if it doesn't fit into our preconceived notions. Little did the disciples know, however, that it wouldn't be long before they turned the world upside down with the message of a resurrected Messiah. But at this moment, they were confused about God's timing, scripture meaning, and even their own preconceived notions. Well, in the last section of this chapter, we're going to be looking at another interaction that Jesus had. So turn with me one more time to Luke chapter 18 as, and follow along as I read from verse 35. Luke chapter 18, verse 35. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Hearing a crowd passing by, he inquired what was happening. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, they told him. So he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those in front told him to keep quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. When he came closer, they asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Receive your sight, Jesus told them. Your faith has saved you. Instantly, he could see that he began to follow him, glorifying God. All the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Jericho marked the last stage of the journey to Jerusalem for Jesus. One last climb up the mountain, 
and the fateful trip would end. But Jericho was the stage of the journey for one man, a blind beggar. Now this is one of those passages that seems to contradict what it says in Matthew and in Mark. For instance, Matthew and Mark say that this interaction occurred when he was leaving Jericho. Also, Matthew says that there were two blind men. Mark and Luke both say there was none. However, it's quite possible that Luke is speaking of two Jerichos, separated more or less by about a mile. There was the old city of Jericho and the new one built by Herod the Great. It's also possible that there was more than one miracle of the blind receiving their sight at that place. So if we take all these things into account, you can really see that there isn't really a contradiction at all. So as this blind man was sitting by the road begging, someone from the passing, the passing crowd told him that Jesus was passing by. Somehow he recognized Jesus as the Messiah because he addressed them as the son of David. He then asked the Lord to have mercy on him. This was his way of asking to restore his sight. Well, it seems that the crowd in front of him had greater things in mind for Jesus than to tend to a whining blind beggar. So they told him to keep quiet. They told him to basically shut up. But the beggar refused to be silenced. He instead turned up the volume and kept shouting even more passionately, Son of David, have mercy on me. The beauty of it all was that even though the people weren't interested in a beggar, Jesus was. So Jesus stopped and just stood still. On this verse, biblical commentator John Darby made his insightful comment. Joshua once bade the sun stand still in the heavens. But here the Lord of the sun and moon and the heavens stand still at the bidding of a blind beggar. At Jesus' command, the beggar was brought to him. The Lord asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And without hesitation or gen generalization, the beggar began, or the, be the beggar replied that he just wanted his sight. Now notice that his prayer wasn't a long drawn out story or explanation. Instead, his prayer was short, specific, and full of faith. Well, the Lord didn't hesitate either and granted his re request. And instantly he could see. Jesus then blessed him, the man by telling him, your faith has saved you. This disabled, poverty-stricken man refused to give up. He trusted in Jesus, whom his eyes can now see. Now, I'm not sure if you notice this too, but here were many notable aspects of this man's faith that made him ready to receive from Jesus. It was faith that wanted Jesus. It was faith that knew who he was. It was faith that they knew what he deserved from Jesus. It was faith that could tell Jesus what he wanted. It was faith that could call Jesus Lord. Once healed, he gave God the glory and praise, which then caused a chain reaction among the crowd. As you can see, the blind man, now healed and saved, began to follow Jesus. The way of Jesus became his way. This was especially significant considering that Jesus was on his way towards Jerusalem to die. Now here though are a couple of lessons we can learn from this incident. We should dare to believe God for the impossible. 
great faith greatly honors him. As the poet John Newton wrote, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. What this also shows us is the importance of crying out consistently to God for mercy, even when others tell us to give up and accept the situation. The Lord will eventually hear you and answer you according to his will and purpose. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The differences between the blind beggar and the rich young ruler should be apparent by now. The blind man was poor, yet he became rich, while the young man was rich and became eternally poor. The beggar claimed no special merit and openly admitted his need, while the young rich man lied about himself and bragged about his character. The young man would not believe, so he went away from Jesus very sad. But the blind beggar believed in Jesus and followed him with songs of praise. Back in Luke chapter 1, verse 53, Mary prophesied this about her son Jesus before he was born. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. When we started this chapter last week, I mentioned that we will be seeing several editions of the Book of Humanity, and each one will have a spiritual lesson to teach us. Last week we saw the Lord use a widow and a judge, a Pharisee and a tax collector, and the little children to continue to show his disciples about living life as a true follower. This week we're told about the encounters Jesus had with a rich man and a blind beggar. The human editions that we've read in this chapter encourage us to put our faith in Jesus Christ no matter what others may say or do. The widow was not discouraged by the indifferent attitude of the judge, nor the tax collector by, hypocrit by the hypocritical attitude of the Pharisee. The parents brought their little ones to Jesus in spite of the selfish attitude of the apostles. And blind man came to Jesus, even though the crowd told them to keep quiet and to stay put. But the rich young ruler stands as a warning to all who depend on character to save them from sin. This young man shows us how close a person may come to salvation and yet churn away in unbelief. John Bunyan closed his pilgrim, pilgrim progress with the warning then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gates of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. Heed that warning today. Don't let another, go, don't let another day go by without knowing for certain that when you breathe your final breath here on earth that you will be present with the Lord. I want to give everyone who is listening and watching an opportunity to, to allow Jesus to come into their heart. So if that's you, wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now, fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, reach out to us, call us, 
email us, um, get a hold of us on social media. We want to hear the story. We want to hear how you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and we want to celebrate with you. While I wait to hear from you, I hope that you have a great week. I hope that you'll go out there and continue to be the salt and light in your communities because as many of you have probably seen, there are many communities who need that salt and light. Lord willing, we'll see each other again real soon. Have a blessed day. I'll see you soon.